Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. We won't have a History's Lunch program next Wednesday since it will be Thanksgiving week, but we'll pick back up the following week. And I hope that you'll come back then to hear our retired co-worker, the historical archaeologist and author Jack D. Elliott, who will discuss his new University Press of Mississippi book, To the Ramparts, 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 To the Ramparts of Infinity, Colonel W.C. Faulkner and the Ripley Railroad. Today, we are delighted to welcome Steve Pfeiffer, Ebony Lumumba, and Julian Miller to discuss Pfeiffer's book, The Moment, which features these two and others. Ebony Lumumba is Associate Professor of English and Chair of the Department of English, Modern Foreign Languages, and Speech at Jackson State University. She earned her PhD in English Language and Literature from the University of Mississippi, her MA from Georgia State University, and her BA from Spelman College. Lumumba has been a friend of the department since at least 2013, when she was that year's Eudora Welty Research Fellow. She's a member of the Board of Directors for the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters, the Foundation for Mississippi History, the Mississippi Humanities Council, the International Ballet Competition, New Stage Theater, a member of the Board of Advisors for the Mississippi Book Festival, and she serves on the National Advisory Boards of the Eudora Welty Foundation and Mississippi Museum of Art. Lumumba is married to Jackson Mayer, Shokwe, and Tarlamumba. Julian D. Miller is director of the Reuben V. Anderson Pre-Law Program and assistant professor of political science at Tougaloo College. He was born in Winstonville and educated in the Mississippi Delta Public School System and is a graduate of the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science. He earned his BA in government from Harvard University and his JD from the University of Mississippi School of Law. Miller is the founding director of the Education Law and Policy Clinic at Mississippi College School of Law where he serves as an adjunct professor. He is senior associate at Foreman Watkins and Crutz LLP. Help me welcome Steve Pfeiffer, Ebony Lumumba, and Julian Miller to the stage. And Steve, we have you muted, so you'll need to unmute your microphone. Unmuted. Yeah, we can hear you now. <clears throat> Go ahead, Steve. You're unmuted now, I think. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, Julian and <laughs> Ebony. It's great to see Beautiful. you again. Hey, Steve. Uh, hey, Steve. I'm delighted to uh, be back here. Ebony actually introduced me uh, a little over a year ago when uh, I was here to discuss with Denise Morse, the daughter of the late great Dr. C.T. Vivian, uh, Dr. Vivian's posthumous memoir, which I'd had the honor of collaborating on. And that book uh, was titled, It's in the Action. And that was Dr. Vivian's mantra and actually was the inspiration for this book, The Moment. Uh, Dr. Vivian was a man who had a great facility with words. In fact, Dr. King uh, called him the greatest American preacher that ever lived, and I agree with that. But Dr. Vivian's biggest uh, hope was that people would not just talk, but would actually act. And when his daughter, Denise, sent me one of his sermons in which he had written several times in the margin, it's in the action, I decided I wanted to seek out people like Ebony and Julian and the mayor and also Missy Jones from uh, Mississippi College and about 35 other people around the country to talk to me about how they actually got into the action how they decided to become change makers. 
and thus the subtitle of the book, Why and How People Join the Changemakers Join the Fight for Social Justice. Uh, be, um, they're the stars of the book, and I want to let them take center stage here. But before I do, I just would like to start with with two uh, two quotes that inspired me as I was working on this project. The first is from Anne Frank. She said, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Mm -hmm. And the second is from Dolores Huerta, and she, with Cesar Chavez, was founder of the National Farm Workers Association, and she's still going strong at 90. And she said, every moment is an organizing opportunity, every person a potential activist, every minute a chance to change the world. So over the, over the last year, I was fortunate enough to get to know 38 people who are from all different ages and backgrounds and professions and parts of the country who are actually changing the world around them. And we've got two of them with us today. And I'm, I'm just so delighted uh, to have met them and heard their stories. And I thought maybe we would start by having each of you, Ebony first maybe, uh, tell us how you define activism and then how that has, your activism has been informed by both your personal history and the history of the region. And uh, one, of the, one of my favorite portions of, of the book, and the book is uh, 35 different chapters, uh, and they're in the, in the words of the actual change makers. I try and stay out of the way again. And uh, Ebony and the mayor each gave me their definition of activism, and they were kind of two sides of the coin, which I really loved. So maybe, Ebony, you could start with that and then talk about how your personal history and the region's history has informed your efforts at change making. Then we'll go to Julian. Thank you, Steve. It's good to see you again and see everyone in the room. It, I've got to say, this has been the process of contributing to this uh, compilation was so enjoyable and one of your uh, moments of activism, Steve, is your patience <laughs> with me and my husband and our schedule. So he actually got us together at the same time to have this conversation, which is a, a, is a feat in itself. Um, but it's humbling to be considered a change maker because I, I think many of you in the room, both folks I know and I don't know, and Julian would agree when you're in the moment, when you're in the action, you're not doing it for any sort of recognition, you're doing it because it's necessary. Exactly. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm humbled by that designation. Uh, we are here also promoting a book, so I'm gonna read a moment uh, that Steve referenced from the book where he asks both uh, Shokwe and I to define activism in our own terms. To which I say, activism is a deliberate response to circumstances and challenges. I leave it that broad because in the work that I do as a literature professor, a writer, and an artist, I've seen activism take on so many forms. Just as oppression has so many tentacles and manifestations, activism has to be that diverse and multifaceted as well. It can't only be reactionary. It has to be forward thinking, has to establish sta a standard before these oppressions and repressive practices take place. Being an activist necessitates thoughtfulness. It has to be genuine. It has to be organic. It has to be calculated. I use this variety of terminology because I think of late, we have seen activism be misdefined. We've seen it go through a sort of pejorative moment where activists are shamed or confused with folks who create chaos. And that's not what activism is. Shokwe's definition, a lot more simple than mine, fewer words. He says, in the simplest of terms, I think activism is love. Mm. It is an unyielding love that says, I can't stand for the oppression I see. I can't stand to see people subjugated. I can't stand to see inequity. I can't stand to see the, ha the harm anymore. 
Most people think activists are angry or mad, and yes, there is discontent. It's a refusal to accept the status quo. But I think of something my father said, if you don't love the people, sooner or later you will betray the people. Mm. When you think about fighting for people or putting yourself in harm's way, I don't think there's any greater expression of love than that. So those are our definitions uh, so, of, of Ebony, love. So Ebony, how did, how did your uh, personal history and the history of the region uh, inform or inspire your activism or change making? I appreciate that question, Steve, because it, gave, it gives me the opportunity to shed a little light on who I am and who I come from. When I think about activism and my exposure to it at the earliest stages of my life and in its most simple terms, I think of my parents. And uh, they weren't uh, community organizers. They, I rarely saw them attend marches or anything of that nature. But I do remember things like my mother uh, mandating that I had dolls that looked like me. And when she couldn't find those dolls, that she would buy the art supplies to make the dolls look like me. And that was her activism to ensure that I knew my place, my rightful place in the world. I remember my father driving two hours to the Delta to find a doll for me, right? That I could recognize, that I could see uh, beauty in myself from that representation. And that was activism because what it did was underscore for me as a child that there are so many nuanced things stacked against people of color, down to the simplest things of the toy aisle. Uh, the hair product, uh, what's on television, what's in movies or what's missing from television and movies that they knew that they had to be active to, uh, to resist those narratives in our household for a child as young as four, five, six, seven years of age. And as I, as I grew, I, I learned more about my grandparents' activism. Again, regular folk living, going to work every day, understanding how they were figured in society and making it very clear to their children, their grandchildren, and their community that we are not what we are defined as by folks that are outside of our culture. So I, I learned of my great-grandmother, a woman who had no formal education, uh, becoming a, a, a veritable uh, bank or, or community um, trust in her neighborhood to uh, lend money to her neighbors at you know low or no interest rates so that they wouldn't have to go through the embarrassment of going to a white bank and being denied or uh, being humiliated. I saw her, or I, I learned of her using my mother, one of her youngest grandchildren, to help her figure up uh, how much a, a truck of watermelons would cost from a local white farmer so she could buy the entire truck and then sell them to her neighbors at a fair cost. And she didn't trust his price. She would have my mother climb on the truck, count them, and, and make sure that she was getting a fair price. And so it was these everyday things that were happening in my family, and they were surviving, right? My, my grandparents, my parents, my great-grandparents, just surviving, but making it very clear uh, who, what they had the capacity to achieve and what we uh, were destined to achieve for ourselves as their future generations. And so that's something that pulses through my vein, and I think it also jibes with the, the cultural history of this space we inhabit. One of the reasons I love this state so much is because of its history of vehement resistance to things that represent the antithesis of love, and that resistance being bound up in love. And so when we talk about the freedom movements, when we talk about civil rights, when we talk about reconstruction, as far as we can go back to the history, in the history of this state, there is a resistance movement that's bound up in love, that's everyday people, Making, taking small moments and features of their lives to ensure that lives that come after theirs are a little bit better and uh, folks can survive another day. Thank you for that. Uh, Julian, uh, you're someone who came back to the place where you grew up and, and that was tied into what you told me about your activism. Do you want to explain that and then talk a little about your own history? Yes, and I will nowhere near as old. Oh. <laughs> but uh, when, I, when we talked about activism, you asked me about it. I said, and I quote, it was very motivating for me to come back home. I think activism has to begin with what's important to you at some level in your own life. 
people have all of these ideals and all these aspirations, and that's great. But if you can't help the folks that are right around you, family, friends, people in your community, uh, people in your community, I mean, it's difficult to be able to help those people issues that you share no intimate connection with. There's something to be said for first making your own house a home before you move on to someone else's. People who come here are often call outsiders who don't understand the problems of those communities and don't do a good job engaging the people are going to have a hard time being effective. And so my experience, uh, I was, I'm from a small community in Bolivar County uh, called Winstonville, Mississippi. Total population, 199 people. Uh, and so, That's yeah, the wrong. Yeah, basically. Um, and so for my entire life, you, you were never disconnected from other people's problems. My grandmother uh, owned a store, uh, a corner store that was literally in the center of the town. And so I literally, in, literally engaged everybody that lived in that town more than once, almost on a daily basis. So you were never disconnected from people and you were never disconnected from the issues that they faced. And so that informed, that, that I knew whatever I did as a professional would be to help people in some capacity because that's what I was bombarded with. But uh, I was also inspired by my uncle who was the mayor of my town. He was the longest serving black mayor uh, in the United States uh, before he passed in 2008. And when he took over, I think he was elected mayor in 1978. Um, at that time, we had like dirt roads. Uh, he had to, he almost got shot trying to get the town, uh, get a precinct for the town, vote precinct for the town. And over the period of time he served, that 30 years he served, we got our first post office, we got our first uh, city hall, and I did our second city hall. There was a furbish that was named after him. We got fire engines, we got police cars, we got significant uh, 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 housing uh, built. We got our park renovated. Um, we got the first. We were we established the first ever homeless shelter uh, in Bolivar County, and so I was always inspired by, you know, his you know his commitment. Not only his commitment to his community that's one thing, but his effectiveness in getting things done and meeting the needs of this small community, how important that was and how transformative that was. And so um, I knew, like I said, I, I had wanted to be a physician. My, my mother, God rest her soul, was a doctor. And I thought, oh, that's the most noble thing you can do, you know, helping someone, uh, prevent someone from dying where they simply don't have to. But my uncles and, 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 and what he did for my town sparked my interest in politics. I didn't know much about it, but I thought that, wow, uh, through politics and public service, you can give someone a life worth living. And so I always carry that with me in this broader activism work. I was surprised when Steve reached out to me about this, you know, change book. At first I thought, oh, it was like spam mail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then he like emailed again, like, oh, oh this you're, is real. <laughs> you're serious, change maker, no. And because I'm still, because Ebony called it, you know, we're still kind of, we're, you know, the struggle continues. You know, mm -hmm. I've been involved as a professional in anti-poverty work for 15 years. And uh, we're grateful to be at Tugu College, which I'll talk more about with the Anderson Institute, that work has culminated, yeah. still in this small space, right. uh, still in this back to, you know, it's funny, all this, you know, transforming work trying to do, is still back in a small, intimate yeah. place in order to try to lead that work. And so it's like we're back where once we came. But, but I think that, you know, I think as, as activists, it never ends. There's no end point. There's no culmination. You keep, you know, you keep dealing with the struggles. You keep working collectively to try to continue to make progress in dealing and hopefully moving the structures at some point, uh, but always being reminded that you never disconnected from the people that you're connected, the, the disconnect from the people that you're trying to help that you love, yeah. which is the foundation. Uh, and yeah, and it continues. So one of the big takeaways uh, from all of the interviews I conducted was the importance of storytelling, both as something cathartic for people like yourselves who are in the moment and in the struggle, and uh, also as a persuasive tool to effect change. So I'm gonna read a, a very short portion of, of another change maker, uh, Michael Strautmanis, uh, telling me about the importance of storytelling. And then maybe you two can share your thoughts on how important storytelling is in achieving the goals you'd like to achieve. So Mike Stroudmanis is from Chicago, 
kind of admitted to having a, a kind of aimless childhood, uh, went to the University of Illinois, was a theater major, then went to law school, and it was in law school where he kind of found his moment. Uh, then uh, after law school, got involved in local politics and ended up uh, becoming friends of the Obamas and going to Washington with them, where he was a counselor to uh, President Obama. He was Valerie Jarrett's chief of staff and now is an executive vice president at the Obama Foundation. And here's what he told me about storytelling. I think I'm, mo I'm the most fully myself when I am all in listening to somebody else's story. One of the greatest gifts you can give to another human being is to listen to their story. It's incredibly empowering if, through someone's story, you can give them a path to make the change that they want to see. You can give people the path to being a part of something else, something bigger than themselves. That remains the most powerful thing in the world. If you want to move policy, you have to find a way to get people who have literally no idea what you're talking about to care. Mm -hmm. You do that through storytelling because a powerful story will resonate with you and you'll be able to see yourself in it because of your own experiences. I always say as an activist, as a change maker, if you can't tell that story, you shouldn't move forward with the issue. Just keep working on it. Keep talking to people. Keep listening. Keep learning. Keep figuring it out until there's a story that moves somebody who is not involved in the day-to-day -day and not personally impacted in a visceral way by the issue that you care about. Find the story. Um, how does that strike each of you, and how do each of you use storytelling, listening, and uh, and and telling stories to try and accomplish the goals? Well, you know, I fundamentally believe that storytelling is at the root of our activism and at the root of justice work, and that's that's a fascinating perspective because from from my standpoint, black people have so much work to do in ensuring that our stories are accurate, right? The narratives that represent us, that represent our communities, that represent our cities are equitable in the way that they are shared and honest in the way that they are told. And so uh, we, we have a bit of swimming upstream to do because we have suffered from centuries and centuries of misnomers and false narratives and uh, sort of constructed uh, truths. And so we are in a space where part of our activism looks like reclaiming that griot spirit and uh, inserting what has become, you know, speculative history because so many of our documents have been lost. So much of our history has been stolen and we can imagine what happened in some of those in instances and some of that imagination, some of that speculation. Uh, to me, that is activism. That is justice work as well. Uh, we're all sitting in the city of Jackson and we know that we've been purveying a story for some policy changes for our city. But when we see that story told nationally, sometimes it looks very different from our reality. And so uh, honest and equitable storytelling and inserting stories into those intentional spaces and gaps that have been generated in order to disenfranchise poor people and people of color and all sorts of disenfranchised masses, that is, that is at the root of every type of activism. My parents with the dolls were telling a story. Um, you know, my, my great grandmother with uh, the way that she used money and the way that she used uh, food and commerce is telling a story. We're in a state that is rich with literary history, but also with art and music and food culture. And all of that is part of a story. And I don't know about you all, but when I go outside of the state and I tell them where I'm from, they already have a story mm -hmm. that they fundamentally believe is true, whether it's accurate or not. And so we we do a lot of work as jointly as Mississippians 
of ensuring that our narrative is equitable and why do we do that? Because to be misunderstood is, it is traumatic, it is unjust, and it filters into every tentacle of life, especially policy, especially this notion of political science, which we are all political scientists. It's the study of who gets what, when, and how, right? Exactly. I'm married to a lawyer, y'all. So <laughs> I've heard that a lot. But we're all considering that. Who gets what? Why do they have that and we don't, do not? When will we get it? And at the root of that is how we tell our story. I'll yield to Julian, but I'll tell a story. Uh, because oh. I'm a storyteller, and I, I can't take credit for it, but it's a West African um, folktale that uh, Chinua Achebe sort of has kept alive in his literature, and it's the story of the tortoise and the leopard. And in this story, uh, a tortoise meets a leopard on a lonely stretch of road, and the leopard, who is hungry, says, ha-ha, I got you, you can't outrun me, I'm going to eat you, prepare to die. And the tortoise, instead of begging for his life, asks if he can have a few moments before his death. And in that moment where the leopard had expected him to try to escape or to plead for his life, the tortoise instead starts to kick up dust and spin around on his shell and, and rip grass up from the side of the road. And the leopard becomes concerned and annoyed because he's still hungry. And he asks, man, what are you doing? And the tortoise said, I want any animal that passes this lonely stretch of road, even if I die here today, to know that an animal and his match struggled here. And so the, the motivation and the, the, the moral of that folktale is to pass on this sort of imperative of struggle to future generations. Whether or not the tortoise dies in that moment is not important. What is important is the marks that he leaves in the sand mm. so that other tortoises that come behind him understand that the struggle is necessary and you may not live to see the mountaintop, right? But the struggle is necessary and there's a, there are other tortoises that are gonna come behind you and need to see the marks in the sand. And there are other leopards that are gonna come behind you and perhaps be stayed because there are marks in the sand and this fight is not gonna be as easy. This fight that I'm using to oppress this population isn't gonna be as easy as I thought. So maybe I should stand down. And so I use that sort of, uh, that folk tale that I've stolen from Chino Achebe uh, and a history of West African people to convey that how powerful storytelling is in justice work. Ebony, be before going to Julian, one, one of, uh... My, my favorite uh, stories from our, our conversation was you, uh, and it's tied to what you just said, was you uh, explaining to me what, uh, what your, quote, punishment might be if you did something like break curfew. It wasn't the traditional punishment. Uh, do you want to explain what your parents did yeah, and I, I almost have a visceral reaction um, to sharing that because what Steve is talking about is when we did um, break house rules like curfew or, or you know, being dishonest, that sort of thing, um, my parents rarely grounded us, but they would pull out this uh, album that they had created and crafted of injustices that had been waged and violence that had been waged against black bodies. Uh, some in our very own family. So we have these clippings of a cousin who was uh, kidnapped and, and murdered and assault, assaulted and murdered. And it wasn't this sort of fear tactic to traumatize us, but it was a demonstration of this is how you are perceived. It was sort of their version of the talk. This is how you are perceived. This is what is at stake. This is the danger that lurks regardless of what your intention is. And so it was for my parents this exercise in this this reality of uh, present day Emmett Teals that news media never covered in, in our upbringing. Th th that wasn't the popular news story of how young black people were being victimized and forgotten and disappeared uh, in these instances. And so their message wasn't necessarily, you know, when you disobey us, this is the natural result. Their message was an underscoring of, you have a larger responsibility. That's why these rules are in place. And we want you to understand this is not so that you feel that we are controlling your lives, but there are elements that do play into the lives that you live that you need to understand, and your responsibility is larger than what you wanted to do in that moment. Mm. It bleeds out in, into our uh, community, so it was effective, uh, and it, it stays 
with all of us into our 40s and almost um, 50 for my, uh, my older siblings, that we have a responsibility to community. And the friends that we kept out past their time, what were we putting them in jeopardy of having to experience because of this, these moments of you know, youthful selfishness? So how about you, Julian, the importance of, of, story, of storytelling? Well, I think it's important for uh, two reasons. One, because as marginalized communities, uh, we don't, we all, our stories are controlled. We are not the, the arbiters, the authors of our own story. And so because of that, because we don't have, we're not given a voice, uh, we can't, you know, the issues that affect us can't be properly addressed. So give you a good example. Um, I, I've been doing anti work for 15 years. One of the first things I've started, I've done, I'm still doing, uh, a great for is food system work, food justice work in the food justice space. And so uh, to give you a background, the reason why I started that work was because when I went back to Delta uh, for law school, and again, I'm a fifth generation Mississippi Deltan, but I learned so much about the area as an organizer uh, that I never knew. And one of the things I learned is Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta had a $1.4 billion food market, and mind you, had a $1.4 billion food market and had the most fertile soil in the world with the exception of the Nile. And local farmers were capturing 0.0004% of that market. It was mostly dominated by sort of corporate, corporate agri-farming interests. And so when we were thinking about economic justice and how do we address poverty in the region, you know, at the time the Delta it still, still is about the second poorest region in the country behind um, Appalachia. I was like, well, of course, food system movement, you know, doing work around food system movement. And there were so many pioneers already of that movement. It wasn't this, you know, the Delta, of course, has its own uh, 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 narratives about you know, its poverty and its, and its issues, but it never talks about the fact that, the, the, about the resistance, about the work, the collective work that's been done, particularly around food justice. Uh, by the time I got there, there was an organization called Mississippi's Engaging Green Agriculture, who were a coalition of black farmers from Bolivar County, who already were pioneering organic farming since the 90s. They established a, a, a farmer's market, uh, they had uh, established youth programs around that work. And um, so it was, the idea was that there just hadn't been a not, a not enough institutional support and support to sort of build their collective capacity to try to capture this, capture this, uh, um, capture this market. So their stories were not told. No one knew this. People even from the Delta did not know. And so I spent the past 15 years of trying to we built an organization, started an organization called Delta Fresh Foods, and working collectively to both, not only to build up that food system work, but to tell their story as well, so we can get the resources necessary to capture this market. Well, fast forward, uh, I get on the faculty of Tougaloo College, and one of the first conversations we had before I joined there was about the food justice right. work, so yeah. it's all come full circle. And so, exactly, yes, and so get on the campus, and so for our economic justice work, the thought was, okay, well, we've done all this food system work, with the it's new Anderson Institute, that, that's going to make it our focus. So we built up a, a campus on the farm uh, and started both to address food insecurity with the students, but as they told their story, they were like, well, you know, uh, two of students are just some of the most brilliant, most wonderful students in the world, but they are broke. You know, they have to, <laughs> unlike traditional students, they have to, you know, do a full course load and try to do, you know, internship and externship and summer opportunities to build their careers, but they also have to work almost practically full time right. just to be able to support themselves. So for this food system project, what we do is, you know, we, uh, we pay them living wages. You know, if they work five to 10 hours a week uh, for $375 a, a week, so they can have safe, secure on-campus jobs. They can, they're building this food system to address both food security on campus as well as the building a sustainable food system to, to, to advance the broader food system movement across the state. Again, they told their story and we made sure that the work we do addresses that. And so it's, support, it's such an important part of that, you know, storytelling is key to that. And, and so we, they told us their story, we make sure we address their issues, but we're also uh, uh, advancing the broader story of this broader food system movement that's essentially black led uh, uh, here in Mississippi and advancing and building that. And then I think secondly, of course, um, as a matter of policy and building 
um, in order to, to build the collective coalitions necessary to sort of address these broad systemic issues, we have to tell our story to see how interconnected we actually are. No matter where we're from, no matter what our differences are, we're human beings and we, and we face experiences that essentially uh, uh, connect us and therefore the power of that connectivity, the power of that collective action is what will ultimately help us transform a system that's fundamentally inequitable and unjust. So I think it's important, storytelling is important in core uh, for, those, for those two reasons. So you referenced uh, Julie and your work at Tougaloo and Ebony, you're at uh, Jackson State. And I, I, I just wondered if you'd, you'd be willing to share uh, uh, what uh, what do you feel your your students, the young people that you're around, uh, are are doing with respect to becoming activists themselves or or potential change makers? What's the, what's the spirit there, and how can you, in your capacities, help cultivate that? You know, my hope is, well, one, I'll say that a lot of the, the activists that we study and that we revere, many of them were so young when they started the work. And so, I mean, that is one of the things that motivated me when I was a college student many, many moons ago, was reading about black women who were taking a stand for suffrage and mistreatment and, uh, carving a space for black women in this concept of feminism that forgot uh, or erased uh, black women's issues. And that was motivating for me, I remember, as a college student. And so one of the, one of the things that I, I try to impress upon students that I, I, I have the, the privilege of working with is that uh, their moment exists within their current reality and that their activism can look however it needs to look. Part of that looks like establishing community. So actually, when I was a, a Tougaloo uh, faculty member um, for seven years, part of the activism that I, I'm so proud to have coordinated with students with was for student mothers. Mm. And it was something that we didn't have funding for. It was something that had no infrastructure, but it basically started out as introducing these student mothers to one another so that they could establish community, so that they could do cooperative childcare, so that they simply had uh, an environment to share everything that they were going through that could not be understood by their partners, that wasn't understood by other students who were not parents on the campus, that other professors didn't uh, take the time or have the time to engage with them about. It was giving them space. Uh, and that is one of the ways that, you know, we try to remind students that just establishing space is so much justice work, space for you to, to be and to share and to rest and to rejuvenate and to speak freely and to feel safe. That is what is lacking for so many disenfranchised communities globally is rightful space. And so my hope is that uh, students understand that they can advocate for themselves for that space, the space that you need. And the, the strongest story comes from the parties who need the support. The strongest story is gonna come from them. Uh, and you know, we, we both position ourselves as resources, as support, but we can't lead your movement. We don't know it as intricately as you do. Um, we can't tell your story uh, in the way that you can, nor should we be you know, trying to voice your story. And so uh, that is part of the, the, the impact that I hope that I have on my students. Every course I teach or design there, I get to sneak in there a little aspect of justice and activism and how they can use these things that we're checking off a list for, you know, for graduation to impact their community, to change their own lives so that they are in a better position to impact their community so that they don't see uh, themselves going through the motions of taking courses because we told them that's what they need for the degree program uh, and then not being able to do anything with the content, that everything that you engage is an opportunity to make, to change something for the better. 
Well, <laughs> for me, uh, that's literally what we've been doing uh, with the Anderson Institute for two and a half, past two and a half years. And so um, when I, you know, when I started my anti-poverty organizing work before I went to law school, which I continued throughout and you know, throughout my practice, and uh, the idea was, what I learned was these amazing uh, people, young and old, in the Delta had such great ideas, had such doing wonderful things in their communities, just didn't have the resources, institutional support to be able to sort of leverage and build and scale those ideas. And so I was like, man, you know, so if, if there was, if we had enough institutional support, we can be able, there's so much we can do that can essentially be transformative. So fast forward to 2019. Uh, I had uh, founded the Ruby V. Anderson Center for Justice with uh, my dear friend and attorney, Raina Anderson. And Justice Anderson is his legacy, you know, of course, you know, we all know Ruben Anderson. And so for his legacy, he wanted to transform Mississippi. And so he wanted to have an organization that didn't reinvent any wheels, but worked with all the great organizations and organizers and people and students and institutions that's already done good work in Mississippi and try to help leverage that and make systemic change. But he wanted it all centered at Tougaloo College. And so I was like, I was with you there until you said you bought it all sent at Tougaloo College. Because I'm like, <laughs> and I had no, I had no stu great Tougaloo students. I worked with great Tougaloo lawyers. It wasn't so much I thought it wasn't capable. I thought, but like, how would you know, students at Tougaloo, you know, they have to work. They're trying to support themselves, trying to get a career. How would that even fit in with trying to do social justice work? Uh, but look, I'm going to do what I'm told. Yeah, it's an answer. <laughs> I wasn't going to say no. Right. I was just thinking through it, how it was going to work. So I had the opportunity uh, to be a part of the pre-law program, to be the director of pre-law program, Dr. Charles Holmes. Uh, who was the auspicious uh, director, and I had a chance, I have nowhere near filled his shoes, but uh, I had a chance to work with the students in that context. And what I was so amazed about, uh, because we started with the, as pre-law director and then we started putting together the work for the institute during the pandemic, what I was so amazed about is no matter, these students you know, working hard, they were trying, they were trying to get them in law school, trying to start the careers, they had to work, but they were willing to volunteer for the initial projects of the Anderson Institute. They did it on a volunteer basis. Like, let me give you an example. For our educational equity project, we started a program called I Serve, where we provided after-school mentoring and educational, educational uh, academic enrichment to JPS middle school students. That program started off virtually, and two of those students started off just doing it virtually during the pandemic, because you all remember, all JPS students were virtual. So they provided them academic support. Uh, uh, at the time, we had worked with 20 students, two years, and they were not getting paid. They were volunteering. Now, fast forward, uh, in partnership with Greater Jackson Arts Council's Arts Diffusion Program, we're up to nearly 200 students. And awesome. it's been year round, and now they're getting paid. <laughs> it's been very, very successful. Uh, and so they laid the foundation's work. You know, I told you about the food system work. They started volunteering with that for building our farm, and now we're expanding uh, uh, our production to uh, two additional, to three additional high tones. Uh, we just had a, a, a farm and table program celebrating it, and uh, we, you know, we're going to uh, uh, continue to build and expand. Hopefully, we'll cover more acres of two with that project. You know, they're now working um, uh, doing in the criminal justice equity space. They're researching and looking at fines and fees and working with the coalition, uh, plan to work with a coalition of um, reentry services providers to help for legislative advocacy. I mean, we just, and we just got a, a $6.6 .6 million grant with National Institutes of Health, with Tougaloo Tufts University and National Institutes of Health to do food as medicine work in the Mississippi Delta uh, around food system work. These students were at the center of it. Yeah. And so I was blown because I, you know, I come from the nonprofit space and I've done this programmatic work. I didn't had no clue how you can integrate students in it, but we literally do that. They've spent, and bless their hearts, they spent the last six Saturdays, eight hours every Saturday receiving training from organizers and activists uh, as part of our public policy program in, in doing this work. And so they're doing it. I mean, what I, my contribution is I'm kind of teaching and training them and, you know, kind of getting out of the way and letting them do the work because they're committed to it. I think this generation is more progressive and more active because this generation is more progressive, in my opinion, and are, 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 are more committed to activism and transforming the society than any because they're the first generation that literally are performing economically worse off than their previous, by the previous generation. And they take that seriously and they're committed to it uh, and, and, and it's, it's essentially, a, uh, it, it runs through their veins. And so I'm just so honored and, and blessed. You know, when I thought about change making, you know, I had all these ideas and all these things that we're doing. I never in a million years thought about student involvement that would be in another small intimate space at Tougaloo College. Yes, yes. But it has come to fruition and it's, and it's really, really, really materializing. And again, they're gonna really, when we look back at the history of the state and look at the issues that we've addressed, I believe it's gonna get better. I believe our, our social economic challenges 
uh, that we'll overcome and, and prevail about, students at Tougaloo will be a big part of that history. Um, I, I agree about the inspiration uh, that one gets from talking to young people and observing what they're doing. Uh, I uh, intentionally included a, yet a lot of young people. Uh, the youngest is still in high school, and then several are, are still in college who are doing wonderful things in the, uh, in the world of, of uh, activism and, and, and change making. And uh, towards that end, uh, I think the sweet spot, I, I want everyone to read this book, of course, and be inspired by it and be informed by the advice because in all the chapters, I ask folks like you to not just tell your stories, but to offer a kind of counsel on, uh, like you say, don't reinvent the wheel and, and so forth, counsel you'd give to potential change makers. So of, of course, I hope people of all ages uh, read this book, but but my, my greatest hope is that, you know, Adults, older people who who might read the book, give that book to a younger person to to inspire them as well. And uh, so because I fell in love with all of you from Mississippi and because Jackson, I know, has had a, a tough year, um, I'm, I'm kind of continuing the tradition of what I've done on the Vivian book and the book that I wrote before them that which is called Jimmy Lee and James and is about Jimmy Lee Jackson and James Reeb who died in the in the struggle for voting rights uh, to, to give books away to young people. And so we gave several hundred copies of the Vivian memoir to students in Selma and Marion and so forth. And, and with this book, uh, the moment, uh, I just decided that Jackson was the place I wanted to give the book. So uh, my wife and I and, and several of our friends have started a fund and we've we've raised enough money now to be able to give somewhere around 450 books to uh, the Jackson public school system. We've talked with uh, Thea Faulkner and others there and uh, we're going to be giving those books uh, away to the students and then hopefully working with the teachers and the uh, administrators to be able to continue the discussion beyond just the book uh, to have me and, and hopefully you too and other change makers talk to uh, the students about activism about engagement and uh, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the the prospects for that so I, I just wanted to to get that get that in here I know Tiffany I think you Ebony I'm sorry you have a, a class that you have to go teach I think right Could, or right. Do you, duty calls you stay <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a class at, at, at 115 but I want to thank you for your efforts in raising that fund and being dedicated to pouring into our young people here. It means a lot. JPS means so much to me as a graduate of the system and it is our city system. So thank you for thinking of our students, our young people in that way. Sure. Um, Chris, do you wanna leave it open to some questions now? Yeah, that's a great idea. and. Again, we did presume on Dr. Lumumba to come during her teaching day. So if anybody has questions for her in particular, maybe ask those first. But if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Out of all these stories, is biographies, what is the common <clears throat> trait, qual uh, social psychological trait that these folks that you gather together as you pull them in, in this one book that you found to lead them to do the things that they did? Uh, I, I would say the, the common trait that everyone has is resilience and empathy. Well, the two, empathy and, and resilience. Uh, patient, uh, I, I, I keep saying the, and then there, there's more than, more than one, but uh, empathy, uh, resilience, 
patience, uh, and uh, ability to communicate and inspire. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Julian, I have a question. I'm curious, coming from a small town as well, but not quite as small as halfway between Sledge and Mount Bio. <laughs> uh, what is what is what are your thoughts on how that's an additional challenge for being a change maker? You know, coming from such a small rural place, uh, Ebony is big city. She grew up in Jackson. City big, city, yeah. <laughs> big city for us. Um, and but but I'm curious as to what you might think about that. <laughs> you know, I I can't. Let me say this. I can't say. Well, let me put it this way. It, it, could, it could have been a challenge, and I'm sure for a lot of families it is because you're, you know, you're kind of isolated from the world around you. Um, it, it's difficult, of course, to be broad-minded because you're in this space, and, and, and I've seen it a lot being from a small town um, that the wrong opinions mattered and, and validation from that space mattered. Like if I had have sought validation from my community and like my peers and things like that, I would not be here. I would not be here. I mean, that's just the reality. So there, those challenges were present, but the, what, what, how I was raised, my parents and my grandmother, you know, uh, uh, my, both of my parents were the first in their respective families to go to college. And so they demanded from, from you know, the time I was, you know, they divorced when I was five, but from the time how my brother and I were raised, I mean, we were, you know, we were taught about different places and we learned to read and we, you know, required to read books and we had the Encyclopedia Britannica. And so we were able to, you know, and we were, you know, again. Encyclopedia Britannica. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, you know, fancy. Yeah, those two. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no but so, so they did everything in our power to make sure that, you know, the experience we had growing up didn't reflect, the, you know, we weren't limited to the community around us. And it works. So it, it, yeah. So and then and, and then for me personally, also too, I'm grateful for my upbringing. So I would appreciate the challenges of a small town of rural America. You know. And then of course my uncle, with everything he did, and you know he hustled, and really fought for my community and made you know something out of nothing. It really inspired me in the work I did. I I couldn't have had any other better experience. I wouldn't have changed any. You know, God made you know made my life perfectly. I trusted His plan. Yeah. He made it perfect. But I never would have changed anything uh, a part of my experience. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be at this point and try to be as effective as I could, as I am you know, at this point now, so. Well, one of the things that strikes me is that, I mean, all one has to do is, is listen to and, and talk to you uh, and then, you know, hear your resumes and know about your achievements to know that, I mean, you could, you could probably be anywhere in, in the country and, and thriving, yet you've decided to be where you are and, and to, to kind of be home. And just maybe you could just talk a little, a little about, I mean, do you ever think about being somewhere else or, you know, is, is, is this where you must be? I certainly know that this is where I must be. And I'll even point to what Julian shared about wanting to be and affect change in a place that means something to you with people that mean something to you. Jacksonians mean uh, the world to me and my family uh, because of how much the city has poured into who we've had the ability of being. And I, I have been somewhere else. I was in Atlanta for 10 years. And so it was, a, it was a deliberate choice to be back here in my home. I often think about, you know, we have so much brain drain in the state of Mississippi uh, specifically. Uh, and so one of the things I, I'd like to share with my students is the places that we uh, tend to escape to, they've only become these sort of destination spaces because someone decide, decided to stay. Uh, and we don't look at it as this noble sacrifice. It's a privilege Amen. to be able to serve in your home um, where there's not this pretense, folks know exactly where you grew up and what you grew up around and what you're working with and still allow you to serve and support the community. It, it is a great privilege 
uh, for us to not only be able to serve in this place that we call our home where uh, my husband and I met, but and also raise our children here for them to see this community that we love so much, that loved us uh, so much and grew us. And now we're able to be in a position to advocate for it in a different way. And so um, it's a blessing. I, I, I concur. I wouldn't change a thing. I would be nowhere else. Uh, there's nowhere else in the world I would rather be and raise my family and do the work that I do. I love Mississippi fiercely and I love Jackson fiercely. And these spaces that are forgotten that I describe as the picture of Dorian Gray for any of my literature folks out there, we get projected onto us everything that's unsavory, everything that's unwanted. These spaces, this state, this city is deserving of our love and Amen. my love. Amen. I know, ditto. I never imagined my building a career anywhere else. Legit. And I'm not saying that as a cliche, like I'm one of those, I, I literally didn't ever imagine, you know, having a career anywhere else but Mississippi. Uh, and, and coming home, it was always, there was always the end goal. Uh, I never thought I'd be in big city life in Jackson, you know. <laughs> yeah. I've come up in the world. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, no, that, that, was, that was always the goal. That was, I, it was trained in me from the beginning, certainly with my uncle. Uh, um, uh, God rest his soul, had aspirations that I would, you know, be here and contribute here, and I'm just, I'm just absolutely blown away and grateful. Uh, and I never thought I'd be an educator, and I will say that. I never thought uh, uh, I'd have the opportunity to work in coalition with an amazing group of young people in doing this work uh, in an amazing institution. I, now that was the, that, you know, uh, I didn't necessarily prognosticate about when I was doing this work, but, but no, I'm grateful for that. And, and, and Ebony kind of described it perfectly. It's a privilege. I mean, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to, you know, to serve this space. You know, Mississippi is where it is because people who would have the capacity right. to do this has given up. I mean, let's just be, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, who, who don't imagine a life here and it feels that what the, 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 the challenges outweigh the commitment to try to make something happen here. And so, again, we're not owed anything because we made that decision, no. you know, but because uh, we were grateful. But, but we want to hopefully inspire others, you know, to, you know, to help, you know, uh, 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 to want to stay and contribute and build a life here. And so, yeah, we're, I'm, just, I'm, just, yeah I'm just so grateful. Hey, Steve, um, I thought you asked some excellent questions to the panelists. Um, and I can tell you're not the kind of person that likes to talk about yourself, but I was hoping that you could kind of speak to how you came to this work and kind of what you've done in the past before you started working on this book. Well, thank you for, uh, for that question. Uh, I'm, I'm living about 10 minutes from where I was born. I'm in Evanston, Illinois, outside Chicago, and I grew up in a, a suburb from here. And I, I was raised in uh, progressive home, went to law school, kind of a, you know, traditional straight from college to, uh, to law school, uh, then diverted from that path, uh, by deciding that I, I wanted to, to write and, uh, cause that was my first love really. And, uh, eventually decided that what I wanted to write about was, contemporary issues uh, that were using and and one of the one of the themes from from the from the book from talking to all these different change makers most of them aren't professional community organizers who spend 24 7 just in making change yeah. they're professors they're lawyers they're doctors, they're still students, they're architects, they're poets, they're novelists, uh, and they're using whatever skills that they have, talents that they have, uh, to affect change in the best way that, that they can within, within maybe the world of, of justice design, as one of the architects who's featured in the, in the, in the book does. And, and my particular skill or talent, uh, if there is one, is communicating, writing. And so what I've tried to do over the last several years is find subjects where I think I might be able to make a difference by either telling the stories of people like Julian and Ebony uh, and the other uh, change makers in the book, or actually working with people like Dr. Vivian 
Morristine from the Southern Poverty Law Center, or Dr. Quentin Young, who was a activist up here and was Dr. King's uh, physician and, and was a, a, a major player in, in um, health activism up here to, to tell their stories. So that's, that's kind of been, been my path. And, and that's one of the big takeaways from this, this book is, is to work just in the, in the, in the field, in the, first of all, as Ebony and, and Julian said, in, in the area in which you know the people and are most comfortable, but also using whatever particular skills you have uh, to uh, to make change in your community. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have some copies of the book. Dr. Mumba has to scoot out, but we have some that she's already signed and that Julian Miller has signed over here. I uh, hope you all have a good holiday break next week. I hope that we'll see you the week after that for History's Lunch with Jack Elliott. But for now, help me thank Steve Pfeiffer, Julian Miller, Ebony Lumumba for this program. <laughs>